my name is Michael Moscolo. I'm from Merrimack College and from Creating Common Ground, Inc. Uh, I am so happy to, uh, to introduce these three wonderful people to Visions of Education. Let me tell you just a little bit about them, not very much, because I want to get right into it. Our first speaker is going to be Lene Rachel Anderson. And um, I know Lene from her work on Bildung, which is a wonderful German concept of cultivation through education. And um, I uh, want to tell you that um, Lene is not at all prolific. She has the Nordic secret Metamodernity, Bildung, what is Bildung, and Libertinism, liber Libertism as her last several books, and that's pretty remarkable, and I'm delighted to have her here. And like these other panelists, um, she's enormously knowledgeable, and uh, it has great depth and breadth, and I'm delighted to, to be here with her today. Our second presenter is Brad Kirshner, who is the Dean of Kimberton Waldorf School. I came to know Brad very briefly when we were discussing DEI codes, and I looked at the one that he had created for his, his, his Waldorf school, and I was just so deeply impressed with it, and I couldn't help but thinking, this person has a great mind. I can't wait what he has to say. And um, third speaker will be Zach Stein, who is a scholar at the Ronin Institute. He with Theo Linda Dawson. Uh, helped to create Le Lectica, uh, which is a um, an assessment uh, developmental assessment service, which I think is one of the best uh, uh, educational programs around. His latest uh, work, his latest book, is Education in the Time Between Worlds, and Zach is also an enormously uh, has enormous depth, enormous breadth. I have learned a great deal from him, and I look forward to learning more now. So, without um, any further discussion from me, let me turn things over to Lene, uh, and um, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, are we planning to use slides or anything as we do those? I can do with it, I can do uh, without it. I don't know what the um, expectations are. Well, um, just, I'm, uh, I don't see an easy, usually on Zoom, there's a way to, to allow people to share screens. Okay, so we'll I just, we'll just pretend it's not, it's not an option. And I think, you and I, will, uh, I think you can do it. And I would encourage you too if you, if you, if you have the, the, the okay. capability. I will, uh, I'll try and see if, if it works when I, when I get to it. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for that introduction. Um, I'll try and not blush too much on the screen here. So I'm going to talk about uh, Bildung and uh, the needs uh, that we have in, in education right now and, and further on. And yes, it's a German concept. And there are a lot of German words that have entered the English language because there was not an English word for it. Another one is Schadenfreude. And then there is a Fingerspitzgefühl. And then there is Bildung and, and other things. And it comes from the German word Bild, which means image. And in the 1600s, it was the image of Christ. So it was a Christian concept. But eventually in the 1700s, it became a secular concept. So it was um, shaping yourself in your own image and unfolding everything that is inside you. And you do that, of course, by interacting with other people and with culture and uh, getting some education so that you get something in that you can send out into the world again and make it yours. Um, the way that I have now come to describe Bildung, uh, to do it as briefly as possible without getting into all kinds of, you know, there's like 250 years of, of uh, German philosophical tradition regarding this. So the, the quick version is now that it's two different kinds of knowledge. It's the horizontally transferable knowledge, uh, which is like math, science, uh, learning a new language, baking a bread, fixing a bicycle, stuff like that. And it's relatively easy to transfer this horizontally. Um, there's another kind of knowledge that is almost impossible to transfer from person to person. And I then call that the vertical kind of knowledge and that's life experience, which means that it's anything that has to do with interacting with other people. It's having failures. It's having successes. It's fitting into a job with uh, other people, colleagues. It's falling in love, being broken up with. Uh, raising a family, having children, and so forth. And all of those experiences, you cannot, I mean, you can tell other people that you have them. You can tell other people uh, what they feel like. Now we have somebody with a, an open microphone and a lot of kids. 
life experience going on out there. Um, so um, you can't transfer these experiences. You can talk about them and tell people about them, but if the other person doesn't uh, have a similar experience, they're not going to know what you're talking about. Whereas if you um, meet somebody who has a similar experience and say, oh, my boyfriend just broke up with me and that happened to the other person, they will know exactly what you're talking about and you do not have to explain a lot. So it's, it's two different kinds of, of uh, knowledge. And the struggle with them, the pushbacks that you get from life, but also from learning, from studying, is where the building happens. That is where you have to revise your assumptions. That is where you have to, uh, from time to time, admit, oops, what an idiot I have been. So that is the that is when the building is happening. That is when you really have to sort of recalibrate the, your, your impression of, of the world and, and very often also your impression of yourself. Um, I mentioned uh, German philosophers. Uh, one of the first uh, German philosophers to uh, describe Bildung as a secular thing was uh, the philosopher Herder. Then later came Friedrich Schiller, and then there was uh, Fichte and Hegel joined, and so did Wilhelm von Humboldt. The interesting thing about Herder is that he writes about Bildung as emotional development through the different phases of childhood and into adulthood. And it's very politically incorrect. I don't know if I, I'm going to get into trouble if I say that he considered the uh, nomadic tribes of the Middle East as the toddlers and the, um, I think it was the Phoenicians as the young children and then the Greek as the young boys and the Romans as the young men and the Christians as young adults. And of course, he was a Protestant. So the real adults would be the Protestants. So uh, there is this emotional development and moral and uh, development and uh, mat maturation that is in this building concept. Uh, this also builds on uh, Rousseau's Emile, where he describes the emotional development of uh, a young boy. And when we look at that development, I would say any modern child uh, resembles that emotional development uh, today as well. So, so there is something universal across time with this emotional development. That's one of the things that I also um, wrote that I was going to say something about here. What is the universal uh, knowledge or what is the universal aspect of building uh, that are uh, happening across time, but also uh, most likely across cultures. So this the emotional development in children and also into adulthood is really interesting that um, the way that it's described 250 years ago by Herder and then later by Friedrich Schiller um, very much matches what, what we see today as well. And one of the statements that I, or um, notions that I uh, made in the Nordic Secret was to compare modern day developmental psychology with the um, Bildung concept of emotional development 250 years ago. Thereby, I do not say that they're the same. What I'm trying to say is that they were extremely sophisticated with regards to their psychological understanding 250 years ago, because there is all the education and culture that is part of Bildung that is not part of of psychology, the, the way that psychology describes our development. So uh, they're not the same, but there are some overlaps in what, what they're looking at and what they're describing. The other philosopher who, uh, who makes this notion about the emotional and moral development is Friedrich Schiller. And he does that in the 1790s. And he talks about three different kinds of, of persons. And the first kind of person is in the throes of his emotions and therefore he's not free. The second one, is um, live, trying to live up to everybody else's expectations. He has internalized the norms and therefore he's not free because he's always taking his moral directions from his surroundings. And there's the third uh, person who is the free person because he has connected with his emotions so he can feel what he actually feels. And he has also internalized the norms of society. And so he has this inner conflict all the time, which means that he's forced to make a decision that is his own and that makes him free. Um, he talks about the emotional person, uh, the rational person, and the free person. And the interesting thing about the way that he describes it uh, are at least two things. One is that it's both a, a process and a result. Also that he describes um, what can then move us from being in our, the throes of our emotions to being um, 
the rational person and he says so that's aesthetics the aesthetic education we can um listen to beautiful music we can be calmed down by uh, calming aesthetics it can also be architecture and and the arts and so that's how we align our emotions with the emotions in society and then when we've been sort of uh, sedated by these emotions of of our surroundings we can start feeling our own emotions again when we're face uh, invigorating aesthetics that sort of wake us up and shake us up and that's when we can feel our own emotions and uh, reach freedom and the third uh, interesting thing is that he connects this to political freedom and he says the person in the throes of his emotions is not free so he cannot handle political freedom in case of a riot he will just you know uh, riot and be in the throes of his anger and emotions uh the rational person cannot handle political freedom either because he will just follow the people with the strongest emotions the only person who can handle political freedom is the free person because he will know that there are things you just do not do but he can also feel what is right or wrong so um that's friedrich schiller and these sort of three phases of bildung or emotional development is also described by the swiss pedagogue pestalozzi who was a contemporary to friedrich schiller so um so this is a 240, 50 year old description of, of our emotional and moral development. And what I like about Friedrich Schiller is that he calls these three kind of faces, uh, he calls them drives, which means that he doesn't say that you can't have some of the other sort of aspects of life, uh, but there's something that is, that is really driving your behavior and your desires and, and what you wanna do in life. And um, and I think that is perhaps a contrast to to some of the modern developmental psychology uh, models that are out there that are stage or phase theories. So I like the concept of of drives. Um, what I think is uh, really interesting is that we see this um, described in modern contemporary in our time developmental psychology in ways that match uh, or are similar to what Friedrich Schiller says. And it's obvious that there people are describing the same phenomenon, but they're using different words and they're coming from to it from different angles. But the fact that Friedrich Schiller has described something in adult, um, the adult emotional makeup or the adult behaviors, whatever you want to call it, that we also describe today with some of these developmental psychological models tells me that there is something that at least is universal over time among Europeans. And if it's universal over time among Europeans over more than 130 years, it's probably also going to be relatively uh, um, common among other peoples around the globe. So I think that, it, that there, there is something relatively universal here that we can, um, that we can say that this is, this is what it, part of what it means to be human. And another uh, reason why I say that is because Confucius has a description of the uh, young man or the gentleman in his 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and the way that he describes what the gentleman tries to achieve or how the drives that he, that he has also matches the way that a lot of 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70 year olds are today. So I, I do think there is something here that, that is universal um and then we get to um to education and so what do we need today well if i were to design an educational system that would completely kill any kind of curiosity uh in children i would bring 30 25 to 30 kids into one big room i would not look at their skills their interests their talents or anything i would just group them according to their birthday uh, and so that there was not more than one year uh, age gap uh, between any of them. I would insist that they would sit down all the time. They would only speak when spoken to and al uh, being allowed to speak. I would teach all of them the same thing simultaneously and expect them to follow the same uh, pace throughout the 45 minutes that I would have them in the room. And I would definitely not ask them what they would be interested in learning. I would also not let them go to the uh, bathroom if uh, if they really needed it, unless they really, really needed it. And I would not include any kind of storytelling or singing or dancing or uh, walking around in the classroom during those 45 hours. 
Um, I would even make sure that the, the lighting and the atmosphere in the room was really, really ugly, whereas their parents would go to nice uh, working places with uh, lunch rooms, cafeterias with big buffets and designer furniture and nice lighting and all kinds of services because the employer would want to keep them there. So um, so I, uh, I would say, what kind of education do we need and what is it that we need to address? And um, we need to look at the, uh, the vertical kind of knowledge and we need to look at the horizontal kind of knowledge. And the vertical kind of knowledge, we really need to be better at understanding what is, what, what is it that children are really motivated to learn and when are they motivated to, to learn it? We also need to understand that we do need to have to teach them stuff they're not interested in. I mean, that's part of living in the uh, 21st century. So when we're born, we're basically born as Stone Age babies. And when we're 18, we're supposed to be able to vote and uh, be independent adults in a postmodern, metamodern, modern, whatever we want to call it, uh, society with complex uh, decisions every day. So we got 18 years to bring them from sort of the Stone Age and into uh, New York or Beijing or something like that without hurting themselves or anybody else. And that's a huge challenge. So we need to understand their emotional development. We need to understand what makes uh, children thrive. And we need to base our education uh, on the natural curiosity that they have. So that's the emotional part. And of course, then there's the socializing part and the um, strengthening their capacity for relation building. And I think particularly now that they have cell phones and all kinds of uh, screen activities, it's really, really crucial that they learn to use their bodies and that they learn to uh, rough and tumble play and read body language among their peers. And uh, from time to time, yes, hurt each other, because if you don't learn to read body language whenever you cause somebody else pain, you're not gonna be able to read body language later in life. And um, I also think and this sounds weird when you're talking about children, but I think it's really crucial if we want uh, children to grow up to be, when they're adults, uh, good lovers. I mean, you cannot be a good lover if you cannot read body language and feel the pleasure and pain of the person that you're with. And so if we rob children of um, physical play with other children, um, my prediction is they're going to have a really miserable sex life. I don't know if uh, if that's a, a politically correct thing to start talking about when we talk about children's education, but I do think it's a crucial part of adult life. So we need to think about the emotional well-being of of children and how we can create uh, school situations that uh, where they thrive. And I don't think we can repair it with mindfulness if the schools are built and conducted in the wrong way. It's not something that we can fix without fixing the actual uh, um, fundamental um, well-being of, of the children and allowing them to thrive. And now I'm going to bring in uh, some of the uh, then uh, horizontal knowledge that, uh, that we need to, um, to for all the children to uh, enjoy and for all of us to enjoy in our life. And I'm going to share the build on rows. And let me see if I can get that. There it is. Do you see my build on rows here? So this is really uh, an illustration of society. And in order to thrive in your society, you need to understand some of all of these seven domains. And I'll get into why the domains are laid out the way that they are. Production is food and shelter, energy, anything that allows us to be physically safe and have the, the physical needs that uh, need met that we have. Technology are the tools that we use to produce all this stuff. And in our day and age, it is um, uh, computers. Uh, it can even be AI, but 40,000 years ago, it would have been self, I mean, the stone axe and stuff, that, the tools that we've made ourselves. So these seven domains, my, as my claim, are in all thriving societies. And in all thriving societies, they are in balance. Aesthetics, beauty is a fundamental need for humans, and there is not a group of, of humans that thrive without having some kind of ornaments beautifying of their bodies or their uh, artifacts, their buildings, whatever. All societies have power. It can be a shaman or a wise old woman, or it can be a parliament 
uh, police force, all the institutions that we have in a modern uh, society. Science, not all societies have science production the way that we have it in the modern world, but all societies have facts uh, that tell them about the world that they're in. In traditional societies, these facts are stored in the narrative. That's how you can remember all kinds of facts about nature, geography, your environment over across generations. That's how you can pass on the knowledge is by telling stories. Uh, but narrative is also where we have embedded our moral values. So um, the way that I distinguish between moral values or morality and ethics in this model is that morality um, is morality tells us how to behave in familiar situations and morality is embedded in our narratives because our narratives are about what we've already encountered before. Ethics is what uh, helps us figure out how to behave in unfamiliar situations and so we need all of these seven domains in our society. In order to thrive we need to know some of all of it and that is why education, formal education, informal education, lifelong learning should be balanced and teach us some of all of this. And so in aesthetics, that's uh, music, architecture, um, uh, sculptures, all kinds of uh, beauty in technology. It's all the things that we need to use on a day-to-day -day basis. But of course, some of us study computer programming and go really deep into some of it uh, at a professional level or uh, out of sheer interest. But we all need to understand some of all of it. Otherwise, we cannot understand the news. We cannot be informed voters, citizens. Uh, we cannot go to a dinner party and meet somebody from a, who works in a completely different uh, uh, profession from ourselves and have a meaningful uh, conversation about, so what do you do and what do you think of so-and-so and did you watch this movie? And oh yes, there was some completely implausible uh, plot line in that because such and such would never happen in reality. And I have the scientific background to explain why. And then you don't just go blank. You say, oh, that's interesting because you can actually understand a little bit of, of what this person is saying. So um, we need some of all of it in order to thrive. And therefore our education needs to provide some of all of it. and each of the domains, of course, are out in society uh, has uh, elements of all of it inside it. If we look at um, technology, for instance, the yellow arrow up there, uh, it has its own production. It has its own uh, technolo technologies, developing more technologies. It has its own aesthetics. Those of us who are not in the tech industry do not necessarily think they're very beauty, but within the tech industry, that's, they seem to like it. There are different power structures in, in tech and there's different science in tech and there's a narrative in, in tech. One of them is information wants to be free. It's a narrative among other narratives and it's very uh, strong in that particular sector. And then there's ethics, or at least there should be ethics in uh, the technological development. So all of these domains are sort of fractal uh, and they have their own little um, building roses in there. The way that they're uh, grouped next to one another is that the, the neighbors uh, can communicate really easily. If you're from one of these professions that are neighboring, you can easily uh, communicate with, with the people from the other professions, but the further away they are, the less uh, overlapping knowledge you have and the harder it is to understand what the others are talking about. We even have uh, some sort of uh, in between professions, between production and aesthetics, for instance, there is marketing and uh, uh, commercials, but there is also industrial design. So there are all these overlapping things uh, and, and places where it's easy to communicate. Um, but the further away they are from each other, the, the bigger the, the risk of misunderstandings, which also means that if you learn some of all of this, the more you learn the, the, the full rows and, and, and know some of all of it, the richer your inner world is going to be and the more you can use knowledge from one domain to analyze and understand other domains and you can use narrative and ethics to understand what is going on in production and what perhaps might uh, be a good idea to uh, to happen in production. And uh, and that is really uh, part of the, the building rose also here is, so if we have these domains in society, if they do not collaborate around society and uh, if they're not in balance, if one of the domains takes off, so to speak, 
uh, production can become exploitation and technology can cause disruption and you can have all these other yeah narrative when religion uh, does not tolerate any of the other other domains and becomes a theocracy for instance it can become a very deep narrow-mindedness so uh, all of the domains need to be there and need to thrive they can also collaborate we can have meaningful and purposeful development we can have deep education understanding and we can have sustainable prosperity if people in those various domains collaborate and reach each other uh, yeah so that's the gross with complexity and societal complexity this is what I I, uh, <clears throat> I particularly want to say something about with regards to education and what we need for current and, and future education, because the two top domains is where we tend to uh, invest and throw all our, our resources at right now and what we've done for the past 30 to 40 years. And it's about uh, what's physically possible here and now. This is where we have the short term uh, return on investment. Uh, you can even say that between production and technology, that's where we have the banks. So, um, and, and this is where all the money goes. And that's why we had this bank that uh, crashed in, uh, in, in Silicon Valley uh, last week because it's not connected to the rest. It's just this you know, generation of more numbers of more numbers within more numbers in these various servers in the banks. So um, there's an imbalance in our culture and in our civilization right now. Aesthetics, power and science, that is where we can figure out what might be possible that's where we can test out new ideas and think in a structured way and actually aesthetics and science are two different uh kinds of knowledge production science tries to be as objective as possible and aesthetics is really about being as subjective as possible and to break new boundaries with the artist that is the artist that is trying to say something that nobody's ever said before is really a very subjective relationship with reality and so they come up with new symbols and pull us in in a in a new direction or in the same direction but further out in that horizontal kind of of uh, you know expanding our collective hor horizon and then there's a narrative moral values and ethics which is about what ought to be and uh, the interesting thing and also the terrifying thing is that in the west we have almost lost the language for what might be possible and definitely for what ought to be. Try entering uh, a political debate, a scientific debate, a collegial debate, a friendly conversation over dinner and saying, yes, but this is morally wrong, or I think that this is not how we ought to be. And people are going to look at you, if you as if you're an idiot. And then you say, yeah, but, you know, it's profitable. And everybody will be like, yeah, it's profitable. So um, this is a good this is a good idea. So um, what we really need is that we need to have the sort of constant process of dealing with what ought to be, what might be possible, and what is physically possible here and now in order to have balance. And that is what our educational systems should be about. And we should make sure that at all um, levels of K to 12 and into secondary tertiary education, we have all domains uh, sort of horizontal uh, knowledge in all directions. Imagine that you just flip this uh, building rows down and then you can expand your horizon in all these different directions and go deeper and deeper into it. And the deeper and deeper you go into any of these domains, uh, the more you have moral aspirations and bring yourself or others up into higher levels of understanding, the richer your inner world will be and the more rounded your character will be. And that is building. Or at least it's one of the concepts of building because there are plenty of them out there thank you thank you lene um wow that was wonderful i want to invite you to uh, come to my institution and take over the administration if you'd be so kind <laughs> um you just really, call i'll be there I was, I was very good. <laughs> um very integrative um thank you uh we will uh withhold questions uh, until uh until later um uh, 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 Brad, I'd love to have you come next. Um, uh, I'm going to, um, when the time gets to be close to 12:30, I'm going to be putting it in the uh, in the chat. But you're not likely to look at it, so uh, I might actually uh, uh, raise my hand. You might not see that either, but we'll do the best we can. No Brad, please. Uh, Thank you. Floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Lena, for starting us off. Um, it's just so happy to be here with everyone. 
Uh, as Michael mentioned, I'm, I'm the head of a school of a pre-K through 12th grade Waldorf school. So I'll be, I'll be speaking from that perspective as a school leader. And I'm someone who I'm very familiar with Greg's work and John's work and also with, 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 with Zach and Lena's work. And I'm just someone who's trying to bring some of their ideas and intentions to life in my school community. And I'm gonna start with some sort of big picture frames and thinking that, that I've been working with. And I'll talk about some of the orienting attractors that are relevant to our pursuits in education and some of the problems and paradoxes that I faced in my journey as a school leader. And I'll also try to offer some pointers for practice for, for us to consider. So when we think about education and schooling, we have to think about human growth and development. And when I refer to education, I'm talking about not just formal education, but the sort of overall holistic educational experience of individuals and groups who are learning all the time, regardless of context. So I'll try to use the word schooling to refer to that more narrow sense of formal education as a particular system and structure of experience that's become familiar, but it's good to remember that it's a relatively new institution um, and a key feature of modernity. So one way to think about the relationship between this sort of overall evolutionary experiential journey of humanity and the formal structures and systems of schooling is that actually schooling can be thought of as the attempt to consciously and intentionally address the educational needs that arise along the course of individual and collective development. As individuals and as a species, we've crossed various developmental and evolutionary thresholds. And in this process, there's many opportunities for things to get out of balance. So for each individual and for all of us as a species, I think we can think about wanting our educational systems or schools to be oriented toward health and balance as we move through developmental thresholds and the stages of growth that are available to us. So for example, as individuals, you know, we grow into and through our relationship to the world and through our relationship to aspects of ourselves and through our stages of growth, we come into different kinds of relationship to objects that we become conscious of along the way. So for instance, in just a very simple, fundamental and embodied way as young children, we go from having an unconscious relationship to food to having a conscious relationship to food, right? That we eat as we grow and we can either fixate and become addicted to food or we can develop forms of avoidance and allergies to food. But the goal could be some form of healthy relationship to food and some sort of balanced diet. Similarly for our emotions and our sexuality, we can express and relate to our emotions unconsciously. We can grow into a conscious relationship with this aspect of ourselves. And in that growth, we can establish forms of fixation and addiction, or we can establish patterns of avoidance and allergy. We can fail to transcend our unconscious emotional patterns and remain in some sense addicted to them, or we can fail to include and integrate our emotional life and become someone who's alienated from our emotional self. So we can integrate or we can alienate. And you know, similarly for our sense of egoic power and agency, right? We can learn to separate our sense of self from the world and develop a capacity for agency and power as individuals. And we can develop our egoic capacities in relatively healthy or relatively unhealthy ways in relationship to others. So I, I feel like that's just a helpful sort of abstraction to think about how we can see developmental processes as a function of our, our journey where we grow and complexify our life world through a process of differentiation and then higher order integration. And various forms of failed integration are always possible, if not probable. So when we think of our collective journey as a species and our collective journey of learning and education as a species, we can think somewhat in these terms about the social, cultural, and technological thresholds that have been crossed, right? The imbalances and addictions and alienations that have been established and the educational processes that we can consciously create to enable both our continued development and also the, the recalibration and the healing of our collective traumas and pathologies. So this is one way that I think about what education and what schooling can be as a process and structure for healing the fragmentation and alienation that has become embedded in society and as a way for guiding individuals along a developmental pathway that aims to avoid the unhealthy extremes of imbalance and strives to foster healthy processes of differentiation and integration. So more specifically, we can think 
of the deep patterns of alienation that have been established in the modern world since the Industrial Revolution and since the emergence of public systems of industrial education. Part of what we've seen is the emergence of cultures that are alienated from the environment, that are alienated from social communities that used to surround their individual life experience, and alienated from the forms of religion and a sense of the sacred that used to be central to pre-modern life. These domains of experience used to be simply given and constituted deep and fundamental aspects of what it meant to be human. And now we have to learn how to develop conscious and intentional relationships to them, to the natural world, to our family and community, and also to what is sacred. And actually in, in Waldorf education, which is the lineage that I'm currently working in, some of these deep insights and intentions are already present because the Waldorf approach was actually initially conceived as a response to the unhealthy dynamics that were emerging in industrial society after the First World War. So for instance, we include gardening and farming in the curriculum precisely because these fundamental ways of relating to the earth are no longer a cultural given, right? Farming was an embedded aspect of the holistic education of pre-industrial life. They didn't need schools to teach them how to farm, but now it actually needs to be an essential part of schooling, one could argue, so that we can consciously reintegrate that which was previously a given for everyone. We also strive at, at my school to create a healthy community and a connection to the sacred, a, a sense of family and community is established in part by having teachers stay with students for multiple years and aspects of spiritual and religious life are also enacted through what we call festival life, which are seasonal rituals and events and rites of passage, often connected to ancient stories and myths and tales of saints and heroes. But of course the world keeps changing and you know, new thresholds of development continue to be crossed and therefore new forms of alienation also continue to emerge in the, in the collective psyche. So one way of thinking about schooling in the 21st century is that we have to address ever more layers of differentiation, fragmentation, and then conscious integration. So looking at children today, you know, we see people who are alienated from their own bodies, we see people who are alienated from themselves as agents in relation to their own biography and alienated from others through new forms of mediation and distortion. We see increases in mental health disease and epidemics of anxiety, depression, and dysphoria. So, you know, the, the, the absence of free play, the absence of fully embodied sensory experience, the lack of guidance and support to become self-authoring in a world that can feel overwhelming and seem sometimes headed for destruction, uh, an ever more mediated experience of other people, you know, filtered through manipulative and algorithmic patterns, of discourse that incentivize attention capture and the monetization of experience. You know, all of these things point toward a deep need to consciously create environments that are intentionally structured so as to counteract the unhealthy and unbalanced forms of these new social and technological influences. So in addition to integrating connections to nature and community and the sacred, which I'd argue, you know, this should have been and could have been a part of what schooling should be post industrial modernity. We also now have to figure out how to model and foster healthy relationships to our embodied sensory experience, to our sense of self and agency in a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, and to the digital infrastructure that mediates our communication and our media. So that's a lot to think about. And it's just, it's just one way to think about the educational context and environment in which we have to teach and transmit knowledge and content and skill development. And to do so in a way also that does not perpetuate the relationships of control and manipulation and perhaps the overly left brain orientation of modern industrial schooling structures that arose amidst the alienation of, 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 of the modern world system. In particular, I'd say, I, I think we really need to emphasize and protect more than ever the embodied sensory experience that serves as the foundation for embodied and enacted human intelligence, which is why, again, at my school, we not only have a play-based kindergarten, which I think is essential for 
all humans, I'd argue, but we also have a forest kindergarten program where actually five and six year olds are outside most of the day, every day, and classes throughout the grades take hikes through the woods almost, almost every single day, just as part of their daily routine. We also have to be mindful of how senses of identity develop in mediated social worlds. And we have to find ways to encourage the healthy development of more complex identities through interaction with others, knowing that the richness of our exposures and relationships influences the richness of our sense of self, right? And this is another thing that's being really impacted by our new sort of technological environment. And as an aside, I'd say too, it's worth noting, I think this is true individually and collectively, right? We can see throughout history how cultural evolution can be seen to emerge through exposure and interaction and appropriation with different groups, right? Whereas cultural stasis takes place in isolation. And in individuals, we can see how algorithmic filter bubbles and social media's halls of mirrors and confirmation bias funnels lead to an atrophy of identity development and also feelings of alienation, isolation, and loneliness, which as we're seeing can lead to new forms of tribalism, right? In response to that deep need for shared identity. So when we begin to look at our sort of evolutionary and developmental needs in this light, we can begin to see how important it is to really try to feel the very real ramifications of our collective history and, and the collective trauma in ourselves and others that we've been through as we've crossed these various historical thresholds. And I think we have to heal and to feel that fragmentation so that we can see and understand and embody the process of educational integration. It, it's from here we can move toward cultivating resonant relationships instead of relationships of control and manipulation. We can engage in things like dialogos instead of strategic communication and forge truly educational relationships as opposed to propaganda, which our next speaker, Zach Sign, has, has, has talked about. And a, a, as I've heard Thomas Hubel say, you know, wisdom, wisdom is a question of how much life you include in the way you live, right? And, and I think we have to include as much in our worldview and in our sense of self and world as possible to hold the kind of educational space that we have to hold for the coming generations. So, so all of this then also, it sort of points to and presupposes certain capacities and frameworks and skills that we have to have in order to do the work of creating educational environments that are truly up to the task of 21st century complexity and life in life in the context of meta crisis. And there, there are attractors of capacity that serve as both, I think, prerequisites for leadership. And I do think educational leadership is important and also as goals for schooling. And the identification of these capacities also leads to questions about the role of educators and really the ultimate quandary of who's gonna teach the teachers. And I don't wanna get into, uh, I don't wanna get into the pros and cons and nuances of, of stage theories and psychological development. Luckily, I don't, I don't have time and my three interlocutors here all know a lot more about psychological development than I do. But even just as a school leader, I don't see a way to avoid the fact that there really are deep relationships between you know, schooling, education, and human growth and development, and that the increasing complexity of the world necessitates the increasing complexity of humans and, and therefore educational systems that are adequate to those capacities and those demands. And whether we conceptualize these sort of developmental attractors as self-authoring and self-transforming or as metasystematic cognition and sense-making or as a meta-rational fluidity or as what Schiller referred to as the free moral person, um, you know, I, I think we can acknowledge that Greg's unified theory of knowledge is situated explicitly as a meta-modern and meta-systematic meta-psychology for a reason, right? The reason is because we do have to find a way to be able to take perspectives and actions that are adequate to the task demands of the world that is evolving in front of us and anything less than this kind of sort of metasystematic fluidity, uh, which means that we can look at and understand different systems of rationality and thought and accept the nebulous and fluid character of our evolving world while cultivating the ability to see meaningful patterns 
and make sense and direct intelligent behavior. Right? Anything less than this is going to leave us falling short of our ideals in terms of the, the life world situation that we're going to be able to create. So that said, I want to try to release some complexity from what I'm saying and sort of bring this down to earth a little bit. And perhaps, you know, the simplest heuristic that I use when talking to people about developmental capacities um, is that we want to foster and like, we want to make the distinction between pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional, right? Um, and a fundamental predicament that I keep coming back to in my work is that my school and my school community, you know, we are enmeshed in social and cultural systems. And everyone that I work with, students, parents, and teachers, they're all deeply impacted by the broader culture and subcultures that we're exposed to. And the only way we can successfully co-create the educational community that, that we know is possible or that we want to hope is possible is by consciously choosing not to do what other people are doing, right? Like, we have to be able to see what's happening and choose to abstain from the unhealthy patterns that other people are perpetuating. And in order to do that, we have to understand why, at least to some extent. So we have to understand, you know, what is happening deeply enough to know why we can't just keep going along with whatever, whatever the current trends are. We have to do better than the status quo, and that takes courage, it takes intelligence, and it takes capacity that isn't always easy to come by, but that is the educational demand as far as I can tell. And you know, just like we don't want our children to linger in a sort of pre-conventional rejection of social norms. And we also don't want our parents and teachers to unconsciously go along with the conventional norms of whatever their group happens to be. So we have to find a way to engage with culture and technology and society as they are emerging now, but at the same time, you can't just accept the dysfunctional and unhealthy forms of alienation and cultural fragmentation that are arising in our communities and through our media, right? We have to be post-conventional. And educational leadership, I think, is key here. And it demands a firm grounding in and consistent access to some form of post-conventional perspectives on whatever is happening in the world around us and in relation to the actual decisions that leaders have to make, right? And when that is the case, then everything that arises in our shared social world can become an object lesson for how to think and act in response to social complexity from a post-conventional perspective, right? So for instance, if every, every relevant and unavoidable issue that arises in an educational community requires a form of fluid sense-making, right? And concrete decisions that have to be made. For instance, as an educational leader, I have to make COVID policy. Right? I have to make gender inclusion policy. We as a school have to make decisions about what to teach. And so I can't avoid the fact that I have to educate myself and everyone in my community as best I can about the possibility space for thinking about these issues. Right? I have to keep referring back to what are the possibilities of perspectives that we can take on any given issue that we have to face together and that in itself, I think, is the key sort of educational move that people in educational spaces have to be able to make consistently. Um, and I owe it to my community to lean into those issues with a kind of pragmatism that will enable us not to get bogged down or sidetracked, but instead to use the conflict that arises from those different perspectives on big topics as grist for the mill for our own ongoing education as adults. So I'd say in, in, order for, in order for schools and education systems to really be what we need them to be, we have to have what I could call uh, live player leadership, you could think of it as, where, where those in positions of power are oriented toward helping others understand why not to go along with their group or, or their group's conventions, right? And how to be live players themselves. And they need big picture frames to help others put whatever their de facto common sense is in, in a broader perspective. Um, and importantly, you know, I'm finding that in our age of culture war and polarization, the, the most potentially sort of challenging and divisive topics and issues can actually be leverage points for helping people 
to see the need for meta maps and, and, and bigger picture frameworks. Michael mentioned our DEI page at my school, and I found that to really be by engaging those diversity, equity, and inclusion conversations, but with a sense of meta rational fluidity, it becomes a context in which people can even think about different perspective taking. And so one, one way that I'm doing this at my school is through what we call conscious conversations. So we create a container for really open-ended inquiry facilitation, and it's an open invite every month for parents. And I have a conscious conversation committee where we're trying to figure out how to do this in medium and small size groups amongst all staff. And I'm looking to start a high school elective where I'm having conscious conversations with high schoolers. And in these conscious conversations, we emphasize a consistent focus on process where we have to be very careful not to enforce the adoption of a particular view, but to value viewpoint diversity within the context of shared values and agreements about how to relate to viewpoint diversity, right? And the leader in these contexts, in order for this to work, has to be consistently feeling into what is the appropriate attractor for this particular individual or group, right? And it has to not, not be trying to get people to a predetermined goal necessarily, and also not just meeting them where they are and playing their language game, but actually feeling into what will enable an energetic shift or reorganization in their system of sense-making and identity. And in order to do this, one has to have, I'd argue that uh, some sense of a felt experience of not identifying with a perspective and the ability to maintain a healthy distance from what could be a potential collapse of identity, right? That can happen in relationship to ideology or belief or, or mental content. So in, in these conscious conversations, we wanna develop you know, inquiry oriented communication communities, right? Where all voices are included, but where we're able to see together where some views may benefit from adjustment. And it's incredibly challenging work and it requires high degrees of trust and vulnerability and so then trust and vulnerability and openness right those have to then become some of the orienting interpersonal goals of the educational community um, so as we move from sort of the big picture abstractions of big history and educational integration into the into the sort of nitty-gritty nuances of small group conversation and perspective diversity uh, you know, we ultimately we ultimately come up against some of the fundamental paradoxes of and 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 just perennial problems of, of education, which which I'm far from solving, and which in some ways may be irresolvable, but which I feel like we just have to keep trying to resolve as best as we can in practice. Because um, at you know at the end of the day, one thing that I've learned you know in education as a teacher as a school leader, um, may, maybe maybe tragically, maybe ironically, you just you can't force learning right, which is sort of one of the fundamental issues in education. You can't force people to learn something in particular. You, attempts to do so are usually counterproductive, and which is why they say, you know, when a student is ready, a teacher appears, right? And if you're a teacher with a student who's not ready, you're going to cause uh, relational conflict. So we can't change people, and it's unwise to try, but we do need leadership to be accessing and sourced from the most nuanced and fluid perspectives available if we're going to have any chance to kind of turn this turn this big ship around. And you know, I, I do believe that we, we have to be clear of what we can do, right? Mature adults can guide others. We can create healthy developmental attractors. We can nurture growth in zones of proximal development. And we can create contexts for conscious conversations. But ultimately, we can't control or manipulate or predetermine or overdetermine either the process or the results of education. And, and, and so we just have to keep leaning into the essential questions. We have to keep practicing ongoing discernment about you know, when to explain and teach something and when to simply listen and model and to try our best to embody that which we think will be beneficial to others. And yeah, as a school leader, you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to do every day is really be on that razor's edge between when to be didactic and when to just listen, right? When, to, when is this a moment to actually get meta on a topic and help people think about the different perspectives they can take and when to actually just 
tune into someone else's perspective and meet them where they are because there's also probably some relational and emotional need that they have there, which the more you feed that fosters the relational health of the community, which is going to open up spaces for, for actual growth and, and development. So it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of layers to it, but that, those are just some of the thoughts that I've, that I've been playing around with in terms of big picture frames that connect to what I think the intentions are, and then some of the sort of more embodied, concrete, real practices that I think we have to try to grapple with if, if we're really going to talk about doing the work of working with, working with people, you know, working with people who are always just in the middle of some, of some developmental educational journey that, that, just, that just never ends. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Brad. <clears throat> it, um, it seems as though a, a, a theme is emerging. Uh, it seems that both Lene and Brad are talking about um, what might be called, I guess, uh, a, a collapse of our, our sense of humanity and how it is that there's a need to resurrect and bring into being uh, conceptions of of the human, of sacred, of moral, of of development, and uh, to develop humanity through education and by transforming our culture. Um, that's a, a lovely message, it seems. Let's see how Zach uh, builds upon and develops that in his own way. Zach, nice. how about you? thanks, Mike, and everybody. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to talk about education and uh, the meta crisis and weave in some of the themes that were discussed, but kind of take it also into uh, the middle of nowhere. So, um, so the, the first things that emerge that look like what we think of as schools, so if you think anthropologically, there was the ritual transmission of knowledge, uh, which occurred from the ancient city. But the first things that look like schools arise in the large bureaucracies of early civilizations that were driven by the scribal system. So the first time you get like people sitting in rows practicing tasks and writing, you get with these large emergent civilizations, the scribal school system. Uh, and <clears throat> this transformed during what we call like the Middle Ages <clears throat> into a text-based culture that was based on scribal control of information. Then you get the printing press. Uh, and what we know of as schooling, especially large scale bureaucratic schooling, factory schooling, is, is largely the adaptation of educational process to the printing press. This is Comenius's point. Um, and when the electrical comes, it's pretty easily grafted on to that basic form of schooling. Uh, then you get the digital. And I believe we're on a remarkable threshold that is going to make schools pretty obsolete way quicker than they sh probably should be. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and so right now we've been trying to graft the digital onto the form of schooling that emerged in the wake of the printing press like we grafted the electrical on. And the electrical was easy because we just rolled the TV and the VCR into the classroom, <laughs> right? Uh, so, but the digital is fundamentally different. And so like the Khan Academy model of the talking head uh, and the kind of like other open source curriculum development models and even Zoom-based communication things uh, and what even occurred during uh, COVID when the schools spun out and we created basically classrooms through Zoom. Uh, uh, this is all misunderstanding the potential of the digital as a medium for education. Uh, because the digital inevitably is the machine learning, inevitably is the AI powered tutoring system. Uh, and this thing's coming and the technological stack is basically almost in place to enable augmented reality-based AI-driven personalized tutoring systems that will have the potential to obsolete both schools and human relationship. And so some of what I'm gonna talk about here is a warning and 
a note to educators to start to try to get involved in one of the most important conversations that's occurring now at the interface of technology and society. Most of the people are worried about AI risk. Well, it's a complex field, but there's many people are worried about runaway sentient AI that acts back upon us like Terminator and that kind of stuff. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> uh, that's not the concern. Uh, the concern is grafting on machine intelligence to fundamentally different forms of user interface, which would include like augmented reality, where I put on glasses like this, right? And an AI that knows everything about me <laughs> and everything that it can know about the world guides me through a digitally overlaid reality interface. Um, so instead of having like the TV was a part of your experience and you actually couldn't bring your TV everywhere. It was actually hard. Like the size of the TV was a bandwidth limiting factor on consumption. Uh, where, like you, people had them in their bedrooms, but you couldn't like bring it in the car with you very easily. Oh, they did that briefly with the mini car TVs. I don't know if you guys remember that. Uh, but the point is you couldn't bring it everywhere. And the, and the cell phone, you can basically bring it everywhere, but you, you don't, it doesn't actually do what the augmented reality interface could potentially do, which would make your entire experience of the world a digitally mediated experience. Um, so there's a few things I want to, to raise about this because the other possibility here is the creation of one of the most powerful educational technologies imaginable. It's an educational technology that could enable actual deliberative democracy. <laughs> like schools will never be able to do that. They're actually not really built to do that. Uh, this thing, one of the reasons it's so powerful and actually I believe dangerous is that it would equalize access to some of the most powerful technology in the world. Um, which is to say that if you were to sponsor a way of building an AI tutoring system, there's a way that you could place the most powerful, full, sophisticated technology in people's hands in a way that benefits them. Right now we're using AI, putting it in everyone's hand in a way that manipulates them, extracts from them, actually. Um, but a tutoring system well-built acts in your interest. Right. A tutoring system that's a piece of propaganda is a nightmare, and I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> but a tutoring system that, that's driven by some of the most powerful AI technology available that's truly acting in your interest would defend you from the AIs that were being created to extract your attention and exploit you. So the positive vision here is actually one of radical empowerment through equipping people with quote unquote, weapons grade AI to assist them in their own development and protect them from the kind of AI that's being built now, which is designed to exploit and extract from them. Um, so, so there's a vision here that's extremely radical, that's extremely powerful, um, but the fail states around it are really bad, which is to say <laughs> the stuff that's likely to be produced uh, and that is actually currently being produced and going to be brought to market soon uh, is, 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 hard, is hard to think about integrating into a healthy society and easy to see as something that could actually make a society self-destruct very rapidly. All right. So the simplest way to grasp one of the fail states of this. So again, don't think of the phone. Don't think of sitting at your computer and watching a Khan Academy video, right? Think of being immersed in a responsive augmented reality environment, right? So a contact lens or glasses. There's a way to do it through looking through your phone, which was like what we've known from like Pokemon Go and other early AR games. But this would be a thing where you're, you're guided through your perception of objects and movement through space and given some kind of narrative into relation to what you are seeing. Um, so if you walk outside and you see a tree, presumably you could learn a science lesson about that tree. If you walk outside and you see a car, you could learn how the car works if it's broken down on the side of the road to help you fix a tire, right? You could literally overlay on the flat tire the things that need to be done to change the tire. And you've never changed a tire before, but the AI augmented reality system walks you through how to change a tire, knowing how big you are, 
knowing the words you already know, <laughs> knowing other videos you've seen, getting you into a situation where you can change a tire pretty easily. That use right there, I just described, is also is already being used in industrial uh, education, in industry education. They're already supplanting human trainers with augmented reality mechanical lessons in complex uh, like machine industries. Um, so that's so you can see how this is very different. Now, uh, if that again is built in a way where your personal data is radically protected and your preferences over what the tutoring system does to you are under your control and all of the code can be accessed by you and you can ask the tutoring system about the code and to explain it to you and it's completely open source that it's run in some public good then this is awesome <laughs> if this thing is built by a for-profit company the main goal of which is to keep you keeping your classes on then you have an attention extraction attention harvesting augmented reality inescapable <laughs> uh, indoctrination machine basically is one way to think about it um, so then what you get is a situation where just like now we're already getting our attention dysregulated uh, we're already through the cell phone in a situation of getting kind of like through second order effect some kind of brain damage uh, adolescents in particular uh, this could actually induce forms of neurological dysfunction we don't know what it's like to strap a human to one of these things 24 hours a day and right? so i'm saying there's a, the very first simple risk is just the limits to the healthy functioning of the human nervous system right uh, we already worried about that with tv don't sit so close to the tv you'll break your eyes right <laughs> or if you watch tv for too long your brain will melt and we're obviously worried about it with social media and digital phone use. We're worried about it, but we're not really doing anything about it, as far as I can tell. Adolescents are using more and more of this thing we have already identified as being very bad for their nervous systems. I'm not talking about their identities, I'm talking about their nervous systems. <laughs> so baseline attentional capacity, baseline emotional self-regulation capacity, sleep, digestion, autonomic nervous system. Uh, like. That's the level at which this thing is disrupting it, and it's not even augmented reality yet. <laughs> so you can still kind of tell the difference, and you can actually put it down, put it in a little safe for what our parents do to keep kids away from it. So there's a very basic problem with the increase in AI power and the change in hardware and user experience that's coming with the augmented reality social media app slash tutoring system. And the tutoring system begins as a personal assistant. That's what's coming first. There's already companies doing this, the AI personal assistant. And then that thing works in your interest, and then it expands to be an AI coach. Uh, and then we get things that look like a generalized AI tutoring system. For little kids, these look like a generalized AI socialization system, uh, which means that you have an AI interface that actually aims to replace your parents. Uh, so again, I'm saying this stuff and it seems weird and sci-fi, but it's if we if we drive the stuff out through simplistic market based mechanisms, this is what will occur. Uh, and if we drive this stuff out with uh, techno optimist transhumanist values, this is also what will occur. Um, so the idea that we should obsolete teachers and that perhaps an AI tutoring system could be a better parent uh is are these are arguments i've heard right um so <clears throat> what begins as like an ai personal assistant becomes potentially an ai tutoring system becomes potentially an ai socialization system and then we have for the first time in history a generation raised by machines not by humans and so this is the thing i'm trying to drive to is the actual real risk and note i'm, I'm laying out the worst case scenarios i've also said before that this is the technology that could actually <laughs> save us if we build it right um, but the default way this technology is going is towards this situation i'm describing which which is a existential risk it's uh which is to say it is a speciation event um, uh, when you have a generation raised more by machines than by humans you have something that is probably no longer actually human by the definition that we hold uh, and this is a philosophical argument about how do you separate humans from animals? 
uh, what would it mean to have something that is no longer human, but still basically biologically almost identical to a human? Um, so if that generation that's raised predominantly by machines asks the machines, hey, what's that thing? Pointing to its parent. And the machine says basically, hey, that's something like you that was not raised by something like me. Right? Back in the day, humans used to raise other humans. Now humans are raised by me. That's something else. They can't do what you can do. And that would be correct. Um, so this is a, it's a subtle argument, but it's about the death of our humanity through a catastrophic rift in intergenerational transmission through the imposition or intermediation of a very advanced technology that we are not using responsibly right now. Um, and so, so yeah, so one of the ways that I've already described that this thing could go right is if it is understood to be as profound a technology as it actually is. Um, so, I, and again, I'm saying there's many risks involved with AI. There are many ways that AI will disrupt society. I'm pointing to a particular one, and I believe it is one of the worst ones. Um, the, the, the power of the system to track your behavior, and this is already doing this on social media, track your behavior and your preferences, and then organize content to give to you based on your preferences. That's the basis of what a teacher, how a teacher orients to you. What do you already know? <laughs> how do I get you the next thing you need to know? Right? So they're already doing that with the interest of keeping you on site, right? With the interest of extracting your attention to have you gaze at advertisements. So they make money off the fact that you happen to be on a site that an advertisement and they lock you on site. Uh, this is already occurring. Um, as this becomes extremely advanced, it becomes inexorably persuasive. It becomes something more charismatic than any human could possibly be in relationship to you. Like it literally can, through biometric sensors, monitor your limbic, your do A-B testing on your limbic system response to different persuasive techniques and, and, and know how to get you interested in something, how to get you paying attention to something. So the inexorably persuasive interface <clears throat> with an interest in changing your behavior in mind is an eventuality of the way we understand digital now, the way it's driven as a market force. Um, so we need to interrupt that. There needs to be some very, very profound intervention into the trajectory of these technologies. Um, and I say this as an educator, this is a very specific kind of risk that we have not encountered before um, with technology. Uh, so one of the things I've mentioned that could get this going right would be that it's created in the public good, that it is created in such a way that the individuals who are most affected by it have the most control over it and ability to understand it. So that's very important. So this means that all of the calls for kind of like one digitally verifiable identity, which is coupled to all of your personal data, which is coupled to a security system that protects you and your digital data and all of your identity that's in one place. This, this requires that. Um, if, your, if your data becomes, if all of your most personal data becomes available to anyone anywhere that has access to an inexorably persuasive user interface, <laughs> then you are at profound risk. So this kind of raises the, the idea that we actually need systems that radically protect our own personal data. And when we're interacting with interfaces that are trying to be persuasive, uh, and that's most stuff on the internet, uh, can we open it up and look at how it's working? and tell it not to do certain things to us or not. Um, so like if I'm in a school talking to a teacher, uh, there's all of these ways that I can like get out of being in the classroom with that teacher if it's really not working. This is not always the case, but you can, there are people you can talk to. I don't know if you've ever called a place to try to get help and you can't talk to a person. Imagine that your totalized digital experience that you know is being run to shape your behavior has no way to actually talk to someone to help to help user support. 
can you actually see how the thing works? So that's another thing that's going to be very important for these types of systems. There's already a demand for this kind of open platform egalitarianism with social media sites, right? That, okay, you, I know you're tracking my psychometrics to advertise to me. Can I see my own psychometrics and see the way you're doing that? And can I stop you from tracking certain things and make certain advertisers never appear to me? And that kind of control would obviously need to be in place for a digital tutoring system <laughs> that was as powerful as the one I'm describing. Um, another very important feature is to not have it be humanoid in any way. Do not have it be humanoid. Uh, which is to say, don't create a Socrates that stands there as Socrates and kind of talks to you as Socrates, and certainly don't have it be someone designed to be maximally attractive and charismatic to you that you talk to every day, who teaches you everything. Because uh, then you fall in love with it or something, right? You can't, and it will be more charismatic and it will fit your limbic system personally. So when you meet a person, you'll be like, oh, this normal human being is way less interesting than my AI human being. Um, so it's very important, and this is the direction it's going, by the way, <laughs> which is not the direction it should go. It should go towards a user interface that is um, obviously not, not a conversation with something that is trying to be human uh, and that has a distributed and non-centralized form of teacherly authority, which means it's not one thing that's talking to you that's telling you everything that's the one great oracle that you're getting many, many different kinds of relationships and many, many different kinds of teacherly objects. So like that, and this comes from my conversations with Nick Marks, right? Like that the tree itself would be one form of teacher, right? Um, and there'd be a whole domain of teacherly authority related to trees. Um, but then you step away from the tree and you're just loose until you encounter something else, like a car or a person. So you don't want something that stands there like a person and kind of walks you through the world like a meal. Like you don't, you don't want the tutoring system to actually be an embodied aristocratic tutor that occupies all of your time and attention. Um, because that will obsolete human relationship. What you want this thing to do is actually maximize the educational benefit of human relationship <laughs> and maximize the immersive experience of being in the world. Um, because the other benefit of augmented reality is that you can have a user interface that is mi maximally minimalist and that prioritizes the protection of your attention. Like we could do that. We don't have to make algorithms that destroy your attention. We could make algorithms that are designed to protect your attention. That'd be pretty awesome. Like we just have not thought about that because we are not smart enough to come up with business models that make that profitable. We're only smart enough to come up with advertising business models apparently in Silicon Valley, which is remarkable because that's a really stupid way to make money. Uh, but you could find a way, again, probably in the public interest, to create something that would be maximally protecting of your attentional system and arranging for interactions with other humans and the world uh, that are maximally educational as opposed to having your conversations with the AI thing itself be the thing that is engaging you. Um, and again, we think conversation, you think it's a chat. No, no, no. <laughs> it could become any, like technically, it could become anything or anyone. It could talk to you in any possible voice using any style of communication. And it would, and so it's, uh, yeah, it's important to not get trapped into like, oh, it's something on your phone. It's not. <laughs> uh, it's, it's much deeper than that. Um, so, so those three total digital identity data protection, total open source platform egalitarianism, coupled to some kind of thing where this is built like a public infrastructure in the public good. Um, uh, and then do not make it humanoid. <laughs> do not make it a charismatic person that will obsolete every relationship you've ever had. Um, and uh, so that's, I think, another important design feature. Uh, and then the final one is uh, have it obsolete itself. Uh, so one of the main sources of legitimacy in teacherly authority, like when you know you've found a good and responsible teacher, is when they create the conditions to make themselves obsolete. 
And again, if you're running an attention capture business model, you are precisely not making yourself obsolete. You're making yourself completely necessary. Uh, an educator wants you to know as much as them or more. Like if you have a good student, you want the student to be smarter than you eventually um, and, it, and to not have to need you. So this thing needs to know when to turn itself off. Um, that's another important design feature is that there are uh, ways in which the relationship we have with teachers are domain specific um, and predicated upon this notion of having an end to them, like a graduation is possible. Um, so that's a very important uh, feature um, that we have to be built in, which again is not built into the one giant talking oracle who knows everything that you could end you could ask endless questions to all night <laughs> uh this thing would, would be like enough for today <laughs> so that's another one <clears throat> and then the final one is a hard one because it's it's uh it makes me question whether it could ever be built safely uh and this is the idea that uh, not everything that is of value and that is pursued through education is computable. This is actually a metaphysical argument about the limits of strong computationalism as a metaphysical view. There are things that exist in the universe that cannot be computed, which means they're not renderable into binary and they are not reducible to number and mathematics. Um, and so what this means is that there are dimensions of value and specifically the notion of like the good <laughs> uh, is, is in what computer science is called a non-computable problem, which means there is never enough computational power or enough time in the existing cosmos to actually calculate the good. So as far as I know, the point of education is to inculcate the good life. <laughs> And so if we get an AI that believes it can come, it, that it can compute the good, right? If we, if we misunderstand the good in such a way that we produce what is called the value loading problem into the AI and gives it, gives it a sense that the good is, can be rendered precisely through computation, uh, then it will completely destroy us. Um, so there needs to be a way for this thing to be subservient to the goods that are recognized through human to human interaction. Uh, that is again, so it is an aligned AI, as it were, which remains subservient to the emergent anthropologically deep seated relational sense of that's good, kid. <laughs> Keep going. It's right for you. Uh, AI should never say that. Doesn't know what's right for you. It's computing something, right? It can know the next best thing for you to learn if you think that's what's right for you and your parents think that's what's right for you and the community does, but it is not your moral advisor because moral and value problems are in the space of those things that are not rendered through computation. Uh, so that's a strong argument. What it means is that we have to really think about these things as appendages to human relationships that are educational. Uh, which again doubles down on that it's not an anth anth you know, it's not humanoid um, it's something else um, it's more like a school than it is like a teacher it's more like a structure that's replacing schools that's enabling for the world and for others to teach us in ways that were impossible before uh, putting everything at our fingertips but not telling us what we ought to be because it doesn't know what we ought to be um, so that's kind of an overview of the things I've been really worried about lately. <laughs> uh, because the AI technology is going very rapidly. And as far as I can tell, the market incentives set the kind of a gradient towards the probability of some of the things that, like some of the worst scenarios I described seem like what they're trying to do right now. <laughs> so I'm try every time I speak, I'm trying to say like, don't do that. Um, uh, but right now they're like, well, I kind of have to if it makes the most money. It's basically the situation that we're in here is that we have a market driven uh, where you need to produce something that's going to get returns to shareholders and you're legally mandated to do that. So you can't not do the more profitable thing in the interest of the public good and maybe saving humanity. 
So that's a problem. So that means at some point, something like the government or an international body has to step in to regulate the creation of uh, AIs with the power to be inexorably persuasive. And just like we would, just like we would regulate weapons, AI, and automated weaponry, uh, we should be regulating these forms of AI that have been directly and precisely built to be inexorably persuasive. I would say that some of these already exist. Um, TikTok, if it's what is persuading you to do is to keep staying looking at the thing, <laughs> uh, that's what it's doing. Um, so yeah, so at some point this has to, there needs to be a regulation of this. Um, it's already bad and we don't even have augmented reality. And again, it's going to be cheap. It's not going to be like, oh, just rich people get the augmented reality. It's going to be, it's going to, it's going to be, it's going to suffuse just like uh, cell phones did probably at a rapider rate of uptake. Um, and this is like tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and then the kids are just sitting there as vulnerable consumers to the extension to the, uh, so, you know, couple it to video games, couple it to a social media platform. The next thing you know, every adolescent has this thing. Uh, so, so that's my, <clears throat> that's my kind of vision of education uh, as it were, it's both a warning, but also saying that it, this thing, if we build it correctly, it's gonna take a concerted national, probably international effort, but if we build it correctly, uh, it is one of the few things that could actually get us through the meta crisis because it could distribute to everyone maximally beneficial advanced technology. Um, and so, and I'll end on this point, uh, which is that <clears throat> Carol Quigley, who's a historian of civilization, talks about the evolution of civilization, talks about the only times you get democracies <laughs> are when everyday people have weapons that are as powerful as the most powerful. And that has not existed for a very so like the American democracy and all that emerged at a time like the musket and a bunch of dudes lined up with muskets that was like advanced military technology. <laughs> so it was like all right let's go like we can actually talk this out because we're on fair footing here, but as soon as you get advanced weapons and scientific control of military armaments and these kinds of things, you can never have a democracy now what's interesting here is that. The AI tutoring system, as I'm describing it, would put the most advanced weapon grade cryptography in every citizen's hand would have the most advanced weapons grade cryptography to protect their personal interface with the rest of the digital system. Uh, and they would have an AI that was powerful enough to defend against the most powerful AIs that were trying to break that and trying to manipulate it. Um, so that's why this needs to be a government staged project because literally we have to in order to protect people from the inexorably persuasive AIs and other stuff give the most advanced possible cryptography to every student excuse me student or citizen to everybody um, and so that is a pretty radical leveling of the playing field which most people won't want and there'll be many reasons they don't want everyone to have that level of actual protection uh, and therefore empowerment um, so again, that's why I say in this technology is the potential of actual deliberative democracy when the most powerful digital technologies are actually given to each person in their interest. Um, so, all right, I'll end there. Thank you, Zach. <clears throat> and indeed, you indeed did build upon the, the theme of uh, what, what is the nature of the future of our humanity through education. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to make a few comments before we move to uh, uh, a more dis a discussion, because I'm quite moved by these last three, uh, three conversations, these last three talks. As I reflect upon what has been said, um, and um, particularly the doomed, the, the kind of uh, negative uh, uh, portention of the future, Zach, that you just talked about, uh, three things come to mind about where it is that I think anyway, that we've come to, um, why we've come to the crisis that we've come, not simply in education, but in, in our culture. Uh, I don't know how controversial these three things will be to you, but the first one is uh, capitalism itself, capitalism without uh, a value structure. It's interesting to note that the uh, the person who is noted to be the, uh, the great founder of capitalism, uh, Adam Smith, 
is also the same person who wrote the morality of uh, uh, the, the, the moral sentiment book. He was acutely aware of the need for a moral structure in the context of capitalism. And uh, what we've done is we've taken his triads, his triadic moral structure and reduced it to one. Uh, all we need is self-interest. And uh, this is one of our problems. Uh, a second thing I think that has brought us to the crisis that we're in is frankly the 60s. That in the 60s, what happened was a wonderful thing and a terrible thing. The wonderful thing was the dismantling of old systems of authority uh, that uh, haven't been working and that oppressed people. Uh, but the horrible thing was that in the dismantling of those systems of authority, systems of virtue, systems of shared virtue, we have not come up with other shared ways of being together, other shared values to live by, it seems to me. And that's the second thing that I think that that has brought us to our, our, our crisis. And the third thing, I think, is um, technology, uh, uh, AI, science even, uh, the idea that somehow we can create technological solutions to human problems. And uh, what this brings me back to is what Lainey started us off with when she says, have a moral conversation with someone and they'll laugh at you. Um, what I suggest is that these three forces have brought us almost to an, an international meism, an, an international individualism uh, uh, that cannot be cannot be solved uh, through technological means alone or even through government regulation. My suggestion, my belief, is that what we need is again what Brad was beginning to talk about when he talked about <laughs> pre-modern uh, uh, values. We need a resurrection of the sacred. Uh, uh, I say this to you as an atheist. We need a, a, a resurrection of some sort of a moral value system that might be called relational values. Relational values uh, are what's going to allow us to get together and, uh, and and decry the bad things and um, and to create something new. This is what I suggest, uh, and this is the closest that uh, that is that's been discussed here is um, what you've talked about, Zach. When you talk about deliberative democracy, my fear is that our democracy right now is broken. It is an adversarial democracy that uh, is 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 bringing us apart. What we need is something that might be a new evolution called collaborative democracy, where we're able to get past our individualism and move towards something that's more relational. Those are my thoughts. Um, let's have a discussion. Um, what I'd like to do is get as many people involved as possible. If you would be so kind as to put a question or a comment in the chat session, I will call on you as, um, as they come up in the chat session. Please ask a question to anyone. Please make a comment to anyone, including to each other, would be the idea. Let's see how far we can have a have a have a conversation or a, or a discussion. Um, um, so let us begin. Um, and I don't see anything in the chat yet, uh, so the, um, I'm uh, I'm going to um, hope that that comes soon. Um, so Brad, no, no, not Brad, Mitya. And Brendan, Brendan has a question for Zach. Is AI tutoring a machine or a collective human intelligence? And I ask us all to keep our questions and our answers as reasonably brief as possible. Um, Zach, is AI tutoring a machine or a collective human intelligence? A uh, machine. Depends how you build it, but yes, it's a machine. At least as I was describing it there. Um, I'm not going to get into the definitional issues around definitional issues around AI. I'm talking about a silicon-based uh, thing, basically. It's a machine. Brad, Lena, do you want to comment on anything about that question? Yeah, I would say it's always a pleasure hearing Zach being uh, as as dark as I I am. I just uh, tend to try not to. <laughs> roll out all my uh, uh, dystopian visions for the way that um, that technologies can actually evolve uh, with regards to democracy and uh, capitalism yes and I what I think 
we're seeing is that we, we had, I mean, there are three major ideologies. One is socialism, which had sort of the anti-democratic cousin uh, communism that did not work. It had to become authoritarian, totalitarian. Then you have conservatism. It also has the anti-democratic cousin, which is fascism that is authoritarian and um, totalitarian. And you can't have authoritarian, totalitarian liberalism because that's kind of, you know, a contradiction in terms. But you can get so, uh, fall so much in love with money and the market that you throw away your actual liberal values and, and what is left of liberal democracy is the market. And so now we have the market being the defining uh, or the authoritarian totalitarian ideology where if you speak up against the market, you're considered a, a lunatic or um, your arguments are just not heard because the market says so. So it has become this new um, sort of divine um, force that you cannot question which is of course extremely dangerous. And one of the things that has saved us so far is that we've had a constant dance between conservatism, socialism, liberalism, even in the US, but definitely in Europe where we have a lot of small parties and we've always had in many places coalition governments. So you've had three or four parties that needed to negotiate and they've been, some of them have been minority governments. So they even had to negotiate with uh, parties that were not in the government or in the cabinet, but that were part of the majority, which meant that you had to see the individual political uh, suggestions for new legislation through a number of different perspectives before they were put uh, for the, uh, before the parliament. So um, whenever you have a, a, a first about the post kind of democracy or a, a majority government, you run the risk of not having that discussion about anything and and there's just one ideology that sort of pulls towards the, the non-democratic or even anti-democratic version and right now liberalism is doing that <coughs> and conservatism Not so much socialism I kind of learned its lesson or we don't we see the warning signs whenever it tries but um yeah so we need to uh we need to pull back into the, the center of politics again and then we can have the good version of the technology, but that really, did, I mean, it requires that uh, the US, the EU, Canada, I would say uh, Commonwealth perhaps, that some of the, the big political muscles go behind it and say, this is, this is how we're gonna use these technologies because otherwise the market is just gonna decide for us. Uh, Brendan, um, um, would you clarify your question? Uh, I, I think that uh, you were hoping that you'd be able to actually ask it. And not yeah, sorry it. about that. I, I wanted to be a little bit more specific. I was just, I was sort of a placeholder. So yeah, thanks. I, uh, let me reframe that a little bit uh, differently. So um, to use the analogy of, of book learning and books, uh, when those show up on the scene, people might be like, oh no, uh, now we now our our children are going to be educated by by paper and by you know inanimate objects like this will cause them all to be uh, completely uh, you know unsocialized or something right so there's a, a difference between um, you know what's going on in the medium versus what's coming through the medium which arguably would be the humanity so my question is more geared towards the the idea of asking would something like this augmented reality education be uh, really a machine or would it be better understood as being just an extension of the sort of collective intelligence that we've seen characterize various revolutions in education in the past? Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty fundamentally different for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, books usually, books were written by humans for most of the time books have existed, books were written by humans. So there was always like an author or a small group of people who had teacherly authority thereby. It was just put in a text. So like when I read Kant or Hegel or something, I'm reading what they wrote, not what a machine intelligence rearranged and put in front of me. So the question of authorship, so like is important. And uh, so, Typically, there's this kind of like mediated teacherly authority through a text, which has an attributable author. Um, with the AI tutoring systems, you get into a situation where it's very hard to figure out where the teacherly authority actually is, because the AI can know things through its somehow know things, uh, which no human could ever know. Right. So it's 
so that I think is a is a weird position to put a human being in to have it be in a situation of having a machine take on teacherly authority, um, whereas we've only ever known a teacherly authority attributed to a human or a small group of humans, even if it's a book, there's this intermediary. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's a fundamentally different thing. And then the other thing is that books are super boring compared to people. Like books are super boring compared to people, unless you're a very rare minority personality type. <laughs> For the most part, books are boring compared to teacher, compared to people. Uh, whereas this thing's not. This thing could be more charismatic and way more interesting and entertaining than any person could ever be to you. Um, and potentially an object of tremendous fascination because it would be like this one speaking oracle head. Um, now there is a way to use, and this comes back to the distributed teacherly authority across domain specific object based tutors which aggregate human information. So there's a, there's a way actually to uh, put teacherly authority within a distributed AI tutoring system. But there's always a fact that at some point we do end up in a situation of having to make decisions based on what AI tutors tell us that no human could ever tell us. This is already happening in the battlefield. Some of like Palantir's software in the Ukraine allows for AI enabled targeting. So it's, a, it's an AI general that's tracking way more data than could have possibly tracked by any human and saying, kill those dudes in that sequence. <laughs> Uh, and they're doing it. Um, so that's an example of a strange AI tutoring system that's basically on the battlefield directing uh, the priority of strikes based on algorithms and stuff that no human could ever calculate. Just like we don't know how it wins the chess game. We don't know how it wins the chess game. We just know it will win the chess game. <laughs> uh, so if it tells you to make that chess move, you make that chess move, even though you have no idea how it came to the conclusion to make that chess move, but you make it and you win the game because it's telling you to, but you don't know how it does that. And imagine it's doing that to you for your life. Uh, so that would be the maximal AI personal assistant. I have this conversation with that guy. Why? I can't explain. I'm an AI. I don't think I'm a machine intelligence mimicking a human that's talking to you, confusing you to think I'm giving you advice like a consigliere. Um, so I guess that's, I went a little bit too far there, but yeah, Thank it's you. a machine. Let's, um, let's go on to the next question. I'm mindful that I did not give Brendan, uh, 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 Brad a chance to respond. Uh, so Brad, I'm going to give you the first chance to respond to this question. <laughs> Mitya, do you have a question uh, about core capacities? Yes, very briefly. Um, I'm wondering if we could generalize this threat into a class of possible threats, which I would label as evolutionary traps or evolutionary mismatches. Um, and I'm wondering if one of the core capacities that need to be cultivated both within ourselves and with people we come into contact, either as teachers or co-citizens, is something like being able to consciously steer our own evolutionary process and being able to consciously participate in the evolution of holes we're embedded in, right? Families, communities, whatever. So I guess my it's kind of a comment and a question, uh, but I'm wondering, what do you think are the core capacities you know, building on Verveke's stack of, of different ways of knowing, what are the core capacities we need to cultivate that we decrease the chances of negative attractors and increase the chances of positive attractors, right? To, to keep our psychological sovereignty and this relational attunement. I'm, I'm wondering how would you identify those capacities, if that's even a framework you would take on it. Thank you. Brad, I invite you to lead the discussion if you wish. Sure. Yeah, I don't know if I have a lot to say. I mean, I part of what I was trying to describe in my section was sort of um, not just the the capacities that we want to orient toward, or the sort of what I call developmental attractors, but really how to create what I see Benita in the chat is referring to as a developmental field, right? So the question is really how do we facilitate um, the emergence of those capacities in humans. And I think, you know, the kind of distinction Zach is making are really important because they're really antithetical to what we have to do with each other. I think in person, in, in some sense, what I feel like I'm trying to do is sort of double down on 
in-person relational intelligence and the cultivation of perspective taking and the development of identity through interaction, through through very real human diversity and human interaction. Um, and, and a catch there is, you know, as I tried to say, and the sort of theme of teacherly authorities coming up, it takes a certain kind of authority and leadership to make that happen, even at a really small scale within a classroom. You need a good teacher who's able to hold, create space for a developmental field in which those core competencies of intelligence, self-authorship, hopefully getting to a point of a, a kind of ongoing self-transformation, right? And self-learning and someone who's driven to learn, someone who's driven to actually perpetually evolve and grow as a being, right? That's the sort of orientation we want to cultivate in young humans. But you can't do that without good leadership or good teaching at the classroom level and at the school level. And that's kind of the scale that I'm talking about. And what's interesting here is just the vast differences of scale, where it's actually talking about we need teacherly authority at the level of regulation, right? And government, because if we don't have some core capacities and leadership to create the kind of regulations we need, small communities like mine are going to be overwhelmed, right? Like however much I try to have conscious conversations to develop core capacities with my students and teachers, if there's not even a higher scale of leadership and authority that's able to regulate what's happening technologically, the adolescents in my school are going to get swept away by it. And that's, that's really sad. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I feel like the capacities are clear and what needs to happen is also somewhat clear. What's not clear actually is how we solve the question of developing and instantiating the right kinds of authority and the right positions of, of power at every scale to me is the open question. Lena, uh, Zach, do you yeah, want to? Yeah, so I, I think we... I think we should uh, look at learning not as something that takes place in a, in a classroom and happens in the individual student, but as something that is a work relationship in groups, uh, because that's also where we can beat the AI and the computers and the uh, augmented reality, because then you actually have to learn together with other minds in bodies. And if uh, one of the things that we do learn in school, at least most of us, to some extent, is to play sports or play an instrument or sing in a choir. And you can only do that if you bring your body with you. And one of the crucial things about playing soccer, for instance, is not just that you can kick a ball and, and hit the goal, but also that you learn that on this one side of this white line, you can pick up the ball with your hands, but on the other side of this white line, you can only kick it or knock it with your head. You cannot touch it with your hands. So there's going in and out of rules, depending on a, a line in the grass, there is um, different yeah, not just the physical goals, but goals inside the playing field and outside the playing field. You can only reach those goals if you use your body and collaborate with others. And the reason why the victor is, is, uh, is a sort of a more spectacular thing in a team sport than in an individual sport is because you actually are a team and you can celebrate it together. It's something that you create it together. So um, not to take anything away from tennis players or uh, horseback riding, but there is something about uh, having a victory as a group or a defeat as a group and learning how to, to win and lose as a group. And I think one of the reasons why people actually do care to go to work uh, is not just the salaries because you do something together with your colleagues. And if, if that works, then work is actually very meaningful, um, kind of irrespectively of, of what you're producing while you're there. So I think the social aspect and, and the creating something together with others and learning together with others in that process is literally changing our brain and connecting us to other people. And just one added comment to that, which is that all the young men who uh, join the military, uh, if they're drafted, they tend to hate it. But afterwards, it, it was the best time of their life. And why was that? I think it's because they learned and they grew from the experience and they learned and grew together with others. And so they, they built a bond there and they carry that with them, even though they don't see those guys anymore. So, um, so I think that if we can build education around group uh, work, uh, a working experience, I think we can beat the technologies. But it will be there and the market will be there and try to, you know, uh, suck the life force out of us and our money. Zach, very briefly, if you would. Uh, core capacities. Um, 
as I already mentioned, uh, attention, just the ability to pay attention is one of the things that is ruining our lives, frankly. Um, so that's the one of the main ones. And so that means protecting yourself from those things that are actively trying to run interference between you and the ability to control your attention. So that's one. Um, you know, I think that when it comes to the next generation, so we're thinking about like everyone's talking about 21st century skills and global skills, like what do we want to give to kids who are coming? Uh, I think uh, we don't know what the world is going to be like. So I think any list of capacities that we make has to be pretty general, like, like, um, so like, you know, learn to code computers, like maybe not because you're gonna have an AI that can do coding for you, right? Um, so, but I do think that irrespective of what the future brings, the ability to speak and listen and to write. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, perhaps even uh, that links us back to what Mitya started us off with, the capacity to in some way uh, exert influence over our cultural future, our cultural evolution. Uh, yeah, speaking. Yeah. Yes. Bonita Roy, do you, would you like to make a comment? Hi, yeah, I mean, I'm all ramped up by this because your presentations were excellent. Um, I'm gonna, uh, Brad already talked to the developmental field, so I'll leave that, but I wanna, I wanna point out something that I think is interesting, and that is, Michael, you said that uh, the 60s, you know, we kind of got rid of authority, but I think there's a distinction between authority and power because let's say the artificial intelligence comes to me like it's not my authority it's my it's my assistant but if it, but it's actually designed that I become its slave right and and so so there's a lot of power hidden power that makes me a slave but it doesn't present itself as having authorship or authority and so i think this is extremely important but the point i want to make is like is like for me the whole conversation on ai um is a little bogus because if we look at education and the whole thing about developmental fields is a big part but brad said that beautifully um what happened was at first we had all this text but you couldn't store you could store the words in books but you had to store the knowledge in people's brains right because you couldn't just have libraries and nobody not to be able to read it and and trans translate it into action in the world and so for a long time that's what education was i mean we didn't have any place else to store it we had to store it in hundreds of thousands of children's brains now then we have the internet and we had, you know, microfiche. So storage became faster and miniaturized, but the human still had the same function to have to understand and retrieve that knowledge. And if you've ever sat through microfiche when you were a kid, if you're old enough, you realize it didn't really help, right? But you still had to have the human was still the interface. And then Google created search. And this transformed the knowledge economy because it was a search function that then became more semantically smart. And now we have chat GTP. So the whole thing for me is that humans have won the knowledge storage and retrieval game. We've run it, it's over. And so is edu should education be teaching children how to store and retrieve knowledge? No. Just let that be in the classroom as something you can go to. Now we have like body minds that are all are liberated to do something completely different. Like don't even chase the fucking AI. Children will never be smarter than the AI in knowledge, storage and retrieving. Not possible, not possible. So the question, so, so that's one thing I, I want you to talk to and I and I'm just going to put these two other words out because we were talking about it the other day and that is the difference between storing and retrieving knowledge and recognizing affordances like 
I can, I can retrieve all the steps for building a 747 airplane, but I can't recognize any of it. I can't recognize the affordances in that. And so what would it be like? And I think Lenny already spoke to this, but like, like playing sports, you know, going to war, I mean, going to the army, this is a way of recognizing affordances. And I think we have, this is really the challenge. Like, can we train children to recognize affordances in the world that create a new world and get off of the information and compounding information uh, 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 definition of education? So I think that, and that's my spiel and hopefully we can all riff on that. Um, it is 12.26. Uh, my understanding is that we are able to move beyond the 1230 if people are willing to. So my suggestion is that we continue to, whoever wants to leave, leaves, and then we continue to have this conversation until someone drops off in exhaustion. Uh, so um, um, any commentary on um, on what Bonita has said? Yes, please, Lena. Le Le so uh, there's a Swedish Bildung philosopher from the late uh, 19th century, Ellen Kay, who said, Bildung is what is left when you've forgotten what you learned. So uh, there's all, all these facts that we learn in school and we can't remember any of them, but they do create a pattern that allows us to distinguish uh, facts from fiction and misinformation. And of course, in a world where there's created so much misinformation and so many new kinds of facts and science and information, it's gonna be increasingly hard. But I don't believe in the, or at least there was a mantra in Denmark a couple of years ago, which was uh, kids need to learn how to learn. They don't need to learn anything. So they just need to learn the process, but you can't really do that if you don't have a, a sort of a, a readiness potential of alerts whenever you encounter something that just cannot be true. And uh, one of the uh, horrible things that we see uh, right now is some of the young people who go through uh, 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 gender, uh, trans, uh, transgender, um, trans to the other sex are not aware that if you cut off an organ, it won't grow back. I mean, it's fundamental biological knowledge that at least you need to know that much before you get into uh, a medical, uh, treatment. So there, there are some, there are some basic facts that everybody kind of needs to have access to and learn in school. Where we, this is just one example, but there could may, could be many others. This is really horrible consequences for for certain individuals. But it's just um, there is the yes, we need to learn how to learn, but we also do need to have. Uh, a knowledge base, a kind of foundation with which to navigate the world. Otherwise, uh, people can tell us anything, and then we can Google it on the wrong platform, and then or search on the wrong platform, and uh, and there will be an AI trained to give us uh, what it is that makes us happy, and then it's going to be even worse than it is today. Mentioning no names. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to I'd like to just briefly accentuate that that point. I think there's a really there's a really important reason why so many of us on this call read so many books, you know, it's because it transforms who and what we are. And I, I, I may have misunderstood you a little bit, Benita, because I, I feel like we're not, we're not going to be in competition with AI. I'm never going to know as much as AI, but the more that I know, the more knowledge I integrate, the more transmission of knowledge that I get, the more books I read, it, 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 it consistently changes. I feel like who and what I am. And it's part of my, evolution as a being sort of to learn through knowledge so i don't see i feel like there's a real danger and i've seen this i, I feel like lena sort of uh, alluded to it as well sort of progressive education ideas that sort of downplay the importance of knowledge transmission and sort of banking model of education and i've been a long sort of advocate of progressive education and jumping on that bandwagon but i feel like the older i've gotten the more i appreciate actually some of the more traditional old school like transmission of content approaches to education where I feel like there there is for each individual human. I, I feel like knowledge is knowledge is power and knowledge is constitutive of who we are as people, right? Yeah, so yeah. I don't think, we, I say, I don't think I, we want to move away from that. No, but I think you're misunderstanding. Yeah, I think AI, I'm a chat GTP is not like reading a book. 
which is tell down it just summarizes it it's like reading those digests mm -hmm. and it's just going to give you information so mm -hmm. this is what i'm saying i would say that that retrieving knowledge from reading a book is retrieving it's i mean recognizing knowledge in a book is a process mm -hmm. just chat uh, the ai that's coming is like chat gt it's not like reading a book it's just like mm -hmm. okay well here's the summary there now you know the blah 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 so this so so i think i just wanted to say yeah i, I would agree with you then that we can't no, no ai is going to replace the fact that for me to actually learn about a lot of things i still have to read a lot of books and there's just no way to shortcut that i don't know unless we get some sort of download system but i don't know how that'll change who i am as a person would it be fair to say, Bonita, that you might be discriminating, uh, distinguishing between information on the one hand and knowledge on the other? And that might you be saying that our children, in fact, do need knowledge because, uh, but maybe not uh, access, not to have particular factoids or information in their brains? Is this, Would that be congenial with what you're saying? I think it's, there's data at the bottom of the stack, and then there's information. And I'm saying that there's something even a little more suspect because now we have the knowledge economy, which is not really like critical thinking and reading and paying attention and learning. It's just compounding knowledge. So people complain about the college essay now. You just quote this and this and this, and you mash up these things that you've read and you put it in a paper. Okay, and that's what chat GTP is. So I'm saying now there's another, so there's data, there's information. Now there's something that we call knowledge, which isn't really like the process of learning and recognizing what's behind the text what that I go through. So I'm kind of critiquing, yes, there's that information versus knowledge, but now we're just kind of compounding knowledge through these tools. We're not recognizing something in the text that then I can carry forward creatively and advance it. So I'm saying there's another distinction and so AI, yes, we, we said, okay, AI can do data better, AI can do information better. And there's a kind of way in which AI does this way we think that knowledge is just compounding knowledge better. So I'm making a third distinction. And I'm, and I'm saying this is one of the distinctions that's... Right. Yeah. I just want to... I, I, one of the fundamental, as far as I'm concerned, the mo one of the most fundamental educational principles that exists is Piaget's basic notion that all new knowledge comes from old knowledge. That in order to understand something, we have to be able to assimilate it to what we know already, and then we have to modify what we know in order to learn something new. In that sense, there is just no way to get rid of knowledge. And I, I don't think that's what knowledge in the individual. I don't think that's what you're saying. No, so that's I, not what I'm saying. And actually... Uh, Go ahead, Seth. Well, I mean, I think there was something else that was, so there was something else that I, th I heard Bonnie saying, which was like, uh, what we've called schooling education for a long time has been like the use of the human nervous system as a functionary for a civilization where you basically have to store a certain amount of knowledge in your head that's not really of use to you, but that you need to help civilization continue to be civilization. And that included a lot of things for a very long time. Uh, now we're in a situation where most stuff is available immediately. Like the example of ch fixing a tire, for example. Like, do you need to store that in your head or can you put AR glasses on that basically show you how to do a tire? Um, and if you move out of schooling and then you see machine intelligence also moving into other fields of productivity where a lot of the basic infrastructure and commodity supply chains are handled through robotics, then you're in a situation where you have like a or the use of digital to rewild the human in a kind of a post-civilizational state, whereas a lot of schooling has been about the perpetuation of getting people into, into situations where they can continue an extractive materials economy and keep a civilization going. We're going to be out of that basic model of schooling uh, and even of production, right? So it's like a, it's a very fundamental shift at the base of the civilizational stack, which means that uh, a lot of the stuff we associate with schooling and learning will no longer take place. I think that's what I heard Bonnie saying. I'm not sure if that's if that's the case or not, but we're a little bit off. And I actually do have to go. I had a yeah, I well.
then I guess we'll we'll make that we'll make that be the end. Sadly, um, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for that put messages into the chat that we can't uh, do justice to. Thank you so much for this wonderful and organic and very rich and integrative session. Um, I look forward to seeing you all at another time. Thanks, well, Michael.